Uh, so how did you, uh, it's, what are we in now, uh, January 2010, apparently? Yeah. Uh, what's you know what's been your uh, involvement with tw- 2012? When did you first learn about it and write about it? It goes back to the to the early 1990s. I had started work researching fingerprints of the gods, and I was looking I was looking for traces or what might be traces of a lost civilization. And uh, in my research, I came across the Mayan calendar. Uh, and and first of all, I was looking at it. Uh, pretty much as a kind of te- te- technological or, 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 or scientific artifact, which seemed slightly out of place in its, in its context. It was enormously uh, sophisticated. It was very precise. As, as we all know, it has a slightly better estimate of the length of the solar year than, than we use ourselves in, 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 in the modern calendar. Um, and, and I was intrigued by that. And, then, and so I began to look at it more closely and found that there were these notions of cyclical time of cycles of what what goes around comes around and um, pretty soon came across the 2012 date and the and 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 the notion that that some something was going to come to an end on the 21st of December 2012 and this this kind of plugged in to to another concern that I had in writing that book which was had there been a forgotten episode in human civilization uh, a culture that had been wiped from the face of the earth in a gigantic cataclysm? Um, and, and was this going to come around again? And, and were we about to become the next lost civilization? So that was pretty much my, my take on it. In, in uh, and the idea was that somehow there were indications left behind by this previous civilization as to when we were going to be um, squashed like bugs on a windshield? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, pretty, pretty much that. That, that, that there were that there appeared to be a number of warnings in, 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 in prophecy and in myth from, from all around the world that the Mayan calendar seemed to fit into this and it seemed to very precisely pinpoint uh, a date that, that we should pay attention to and, and soon after working on the Maya I spent time with the Hopi and found, found that um, although they didn't seem to have a precise calendrical date they, they were operating with very similar cyclical concepts and the, and the notion that something bad was coming down the line and that we humans were intimately connected to that bad thing, that it was our behavior in a way that was bringing it down on us. And the Hopi are considered potentially connected to the Maya by the Anasazi. They found like plumed serpent statues. Okay. Very, and, very similar iconography. Yeah, that's right. uh, what, is, what is, I mean, I, I, it may be hard to summarize, but what is some of the best evidence in your mind that... Um, there was kind of a pre-existing civilization that, 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 that developed to a high level of global you know, well, sophistication. I think the Mayan calendar is part of that mm-hmm. uh, evidence. It really does, um, it does seem to appear in Central America without, without strong antecedents. It's difficult to, it just, it's just there, fully formed. You don't see it evolving and gradually developing into this. It's just, it's just fully there. Um, another uh, factor which, has, which personally I find quite convincing is, is the evidence for a shared system of religious ideas which are, which are spread all around the world and involve a number of key features. They all involve a quest for the immortality of the soul. They all involve pyramids. They all involve astronomy. Um, and it seemed to me that, uh, that these common factors were, 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 were better explained by some sort of remote common ancestor who had passed down and, and diffused and spread this idea uh, rather than simply by coincidence or, or perhaps by human archetypes. I, I felt that, 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 that there was evidence of a, of a common shared background in, a, in, in, in an episode that has been lost. And then, of course, you get into you know, harder material like the, the, the work that Robert Schock has done on the geological and John Anthony West on the, the geological weathering of the Sphinx. Uh, the Sphinx is supposed to date to 2,500 BC, but the erosion patterns on its body and on the trench surrounding the Sphinx seem to indicate exposure to thousands of years of heavy rainfall, and that rain did not fall in 2,500 BC. So there's a strong suggestion that a number of well-known archaeological sites and, and, and objects may have been misunderstood by archaeologists, you can't date, you can't carbon date a stone monument, uh, and so there is room for the latitude in how we how we, how we interpret it. So, what is the reason that archaeologists give a specific date to something like, um, you know, the Great Pyramid or the, or the Sphinx? Um, it's surprisingly, 
shallow uh, in, in many ways. There, there isn't a lot of direct dating evidence concerning either, concerning either structure, but they look at the overall context of ancient Egypt, and they say, we don't find enough in this context that even begins to persuade us that there might have been an earlier background to it. We don't find, you know, the, the, the typical comment is, show me the potsherd that dates to 10,500 BC, and I'll begin to talk to you, but if you can't show me that so a potsherd they could do a carbon dating on? Yeah, that they could do some, that they could weigh, measure, and count in the way that archaeologists do. Uh, show me that, and I'll begin to talk to you. But if you can't show me that material evidence, um, then, um, then we won't, uh, that we've got too much evidence in the other direction. So we say, well, look at the Sphinx. That seems to us to be a fairly hard, hard object and quite interesting. But they say, oh, no, on its own, it's not, uh, it's not enough to, to justify it. I would also say, look at what the ancient Egyptians themselves said. They themselves said that their civilization was a legacy from, from an earlier culture. They called, it, they called them the gods. They, 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 they say that it went back tens of thousands of years before, before their time. And again, the archaeological response is, oh, ignore that. It's just myth. It's just, just tradition. And they may be right. Uh, but my feeling was that, that, that an alternative voice needs to be given. We need to speak up for this material which, which contradicts the prevailing picture. Yeah, I mean, I was just reading... Um a book that in some ways was kind of horrible, Before the Dawn, by this guy Nicholas Wade, a New York Times science writer, which was looking I've at heard of it, yeah. the uh, genome and the history of the human species from yeah. like a genetic perspective and trying to estimate when we developed language and civilization, which kind of puts language back 50,000 years, like mm. the beginning of language, which wouldn't give us you know, a lot of time to explain how there might have been like a pre-existence. Mm, mm. Um, very yeah, I, 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 I buy into that. I, I would say that I would say that the, 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 there's not strong evidence for full symbol-using capacity in human beings before about fifty thousand years ago, and I, I, I would I would be I would be willing to accept that, that the full use of language may not have come in until then. But I but I actually do think um, that that leaves time. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at, uh, I mean, the whole, the whole story of what we think of as, as civilization and the orthodox view of history has all uh, unraveled in the last, uh, in, in last 5,000 years. It's, just, it's, it's, it's a 5,000-year picture, and that's just one-tenth of the period that, that human beings have had these, uh, have had these capacities. Um, and, uh, you know, the evidence seems to suggest that sometimes things can happen quite quickly. And, and, and changes can occur can occur very fast. So, I wouldn't object in principle to the notion of of some form of civilization, maybe very different from our own. Um, uh, you know, coming up in the depths of the last ice age, thirty thousand, thirty five thousand years ago, somewhere somewhere of that order. Um, and uh, and indeed, all all traces of it being obliterated in in what happened at the end of the ice age, which was which was pretty effective um, global change. I mean, there are a lot of, I guess, peculiar strands that seem to point towards, you know, um, possibilities that are not registered by the mainstream, like early technologies, yeah. like out of place artifacts, batteries, yeah. out of place art. What are some of those? Um, well, I mean, the, the, you mentioned the the, the Baghdad uh, batteries, and, and they're an example. It's clear that uh, that some kind of um, some kind of uh, electric, electrical apparatus was uh, was was uh, present in ancient times, which goes against the prevailing view of the development of electricity. Um, and of course, ancient maps. I mean, to me, these are these are the single most convincing um, out of place artifact. Uh, and and what you typically find is a map that has been created in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries of our era. Um, often by well-known map makers, and they have based that map on earlier source maps which they had access to but which have not come down to us. Uh, and quite frequently they'll state on the map that it's based on earlier source maps. The, the famous Piri Reis map does that. He, admiral Piri Reis, who was a known Turkish admiral, uh, stated on that map in his own handwriting that he based it on more than 100 other maps, none of which have come, come down to us. And the strange thing is uh, about these maps, both in the Ptolemaic tradition and in the Portland tradition, is that they show the world um, as it looked during the Ice Age, um, often in, in remarkable detail. Um, and, and furthermore, that they show parts of the world, like Antarctica, that weren't explored by our culture until the 19th century. 
So confronted by that material, it's, it's, it's very difficult for me to come to any other conclusion than that, 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 that the world was mapped and measured by a civilization that could at least do that, that had ships that could sail the world, that, could, that had accurate mathematics and astronomy to put, to put into maps. And that, again, does not fit in with the prophetic picture. And what about uh, you know, what you learned from your investigation of the Ark of the Covenants? The Ark of the Covenant, of course, is another. Uh, that's an, initially, at any rate, how I approached it as another mm-hmm. out-of-place uh, artifact. Um, when I, that was the first, the sign and the seal was the first book that I, that I wrote investigating a historical mystery. And, uh, and I was coming to that from, a, from a, I guess, a much more um, m- materialist perspective than I, than I now take. I'm much, more, I'm much more interested in issues of, of, uh, of the spirit uh, t- today than with issues of matter. Uh, and I think that there are profound spiritual implications to the Ark of the Covenant, which I did not go into in depth in my, in my book. But just if you look at it as a, as a piece of technology, it sounds sometimes like a piece of technology, Moses is given a blueprint uh, on Mount Sinai by God uh, to build a box that has got a golden exterior, a layer of wood, a golden interior um, that is carried on carrying poles by a special group, the Levites, um, who who are trained to carry this object, um, that uh, in many accounts uh, rises up into the air and lifts its bearers off the ground, um, that uh, flies through the air towards the enemies of Israel, emitting a moaning sound, striking them dead. When the Philistines capture the ark, it's described in in great detail in in the Bible, Um, and they file past, it's opened, and they file past it, and the the Bible tells us that 50,000 people died, and, and what did they die of? cancerous tumors. That's specifically what's stated. So it, it begins to sound um, like some sort of strange piece of technology. That's, 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 what, I, that's what I thought. And, and what energizes it? Well, we understand it's why it's built according to a blueprint. Why? To contain the tablets of stone inscribed with the Ten Commandments, supposedly by the, the finger of God himself. And that leaves us some room to speculate as to what these, what these tablets of stone might have been. They seem to be the power pack or the energy pack in the in, in, in the arc. And I, I do think there's a case for saying that it's an out of place artifact and that if you you could perhaps trace that back into ancient Egypt, um, where there are other arcs described in ancient Egyptian texts, uh, which do similar things, um, which also send out bolts of fire and strike dead innocent people who simply who simply pass by. Um, and since Moses was, uh, if he existed at all, we're, we're, we're told that he was raised and groomed in the household of the pharaoh to become a future a pharaoh of Egypt. Therefore, he would have had access to all of the high magic of ancient Egypt. And uh, maybe he did gain access to a, to a secret technology, which was, which was incorporated into the Ark. Now, I think it goes much deeper than that. I, think, I don't think we're, we're, we're just dealing with, a, with an artifact here. But... There's enough in the accounts to justify at least some speculation along those grounds. What would be the more spiritual dimensions of, of, of that artifact? Well, um, it is supposed to be um, God's presence on earth. That's, 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 what it's, that's what it's all about. That's why, that's why um, the temple is built um, in, in, in Jerusalem. Not by David, because he's considered to be impure. He's uh, offended God in some ways, but by his son Solomon, he he builds the temple on the Temple Mount as an house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and 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 the whole of um, of of the Judaic faith and 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 Christianity after that and Islam too, all come out of this of this central energized power of God that is seen to be that is seen to be expressed in the in, in the Ark of the Covenant. And I don't think it's possible to you know to consider the Ark without also considering that aspect and perhaps in the sign and the seal I didn't do mm-hmm. I didn't do enough of that. But but I mean curiously um, all three of the monotheistic uh, the, the religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam all have kind of end of days uh, prophecies and notions concerning the Ark of the Covenant. For the Temple Mount faithful in Jerusalem, they need the Ark of the Covenant to build the third temple. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got to be put back, and it's missing, it's lost. Um, 
uh, amongst... Uh, is that because it was a device that was used to move incredibly heavy stones? Well, uh, this is the, uh, again, we're free to speculate right. about that because it, because it did all kinds of things like that. Well, but it, but it, it was, but, but the no, what, what struck me with the, the account of the building of the temple and of the Holy of Holies, which again is a golden box, I mean gold is, a, is of course a tremendous radiation shield, um, is that it almost seems to be, it almost seems to have been built to contain and close the power of the ark and to limit the danger that it represented to others around it. It is, it is the sole justification that's given in the Bible for the building of the temple, that it is to be the house of the ark mm -hmm. uh, from, 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 from now on. Um, and and uh, yes, the curious thing is that, that, that not only f f fundamentalist Judaism, but also uh, fundamentalist Christianity, the book of Revelations, has uh, a, a verse about, about the ark and about how the return of the ark to the Temple Mount is to be seen as the, as the sign of the last of days and, and the beginning of the, the rapture and the faithful taken up to, taken up to heaven. And uh, the Shia Muslims have a, a very similar prophecy. And this concerns the so-called uh, hidden imam, uh, the Mahdi, um, who, again, if you go into their text, you find that before he can declare his Mahdihood and make war on the enemies of Islam, he too must recover the Ark of the Covenant and return it to the, to the Temple Mount. So it becomes a very pivotal object in, in, in all of the, the major religions that are so much at loggerheads today. So, I mean, um, interesting. I mean, putting those together sounds like a dangerous thing, actually, would be to, to get that Ark back in action. Absolutely. <laughs> it sounds like a dangerous thing. And, 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 and you know, my, my conclusion was that the the um, Ethiopian claim to possess the Ark of the Covenant actually has a lot to it. That The Ethiopians claim that it's in the city of Aksum in, in northern Ethiopia, and there's a detailed background to it that I go into in that book. And when you ask them, why is the Ark with you? Why isn't it you know, in Jerusalem on the, on the Temple Mount? They say, well, it's with us because that's where God wants it to be right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you think it through, actually the return of that object to the cauldron um, of, of Jerusalem right now, I, I do think it would have catastrophic consequences. So maybe if it is in Ethiopia, it's best that it stays there. Have you looked into uh, Nassim Haramin's uh, work? I was mentioning that to you uh, last time we hung out. Not in depth. I, I've met Nassim. I, I, I know him. I have high respect for his work, but I haven't, I haven't looked in depth in what he's said about the Ark. You've got to go that, down that pathway, I okay. think. I mean, it totally synchronizes you know, right. with what you're talking about. I mean, but he suggests that... Um, there was a you know a technology built on the structure of the vacuum, which was mm -hmm. this this scalable fractal form that would also potentially be you know uh, you know consciousness itself would be kind of based on the same mm -hmm. thing, and that um, yeah that that the Egyptians may have had it may have been a bequest even from a higher mm -hmm. you know more galactic level civilization. Yeah. Um, and um, that it's a, you know that, that that technology would be something that we could you know redevelop mm, you know mm, mm, mm. Um, yeah no I mean, he 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 could be right there is there is so much mystery uh, surrounding this object when you really get in depth into the texts which are not only in the Bible but but also in in the legends of the Jews which are just tremendous there's a book by by Ginsberg I think which 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 um, compiles it's in like ten or fifteen volumes the the, the huge legendary and, and mythological basis behind Judaism and it's just full of incredible stories about the Ark of the Covenant mm, and like about what? what it does <laughs> well the the the, the, the this, this this the story I mentioned earlier yeah. for example of of the Ark being carried into battle yeah. and and its power is so great that it's lifting its bearers up off the ground and bouncing them up and down and then it just takes off and it rushes towards the towards the enemies emitting a moaning sound and they're all struck dead they fall they fall back there's many many so it's, many who's guiding that well the only the only people who who were thought to have the knowledge to control the ark were the, the were the levites mm -hmm. they were the, they were the official bearers of the ark and and the suggestion is that they that they were um, the carriers of the secret of how to manage and control the, the power of this object. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, fruitful and tempting field to, to get into, <laughs> as, long, as long as you're willing to, 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 just, to just open up and look at the material. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite intriguing. As to and, and, you, and you also believe the Holy Grail and the Ark are actually the same object? The I think that, that this is possible. It's a, it's a possibility that I go into in, uh, in The Sign and the Seal. Um, there, there, are, there are many things that are common. If you go back to the very early traditions of the Holy Grail, you find that it isn't a cup. Uh, it's a stone. 
and then it transforms into a golden cup often in later accounts. And, 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 and just those two ingredients on their own of a sort of golden vessel with a stone, an energized, powerful stone inside it is pretty much exactly what the, what, what the Ark of the Covenant is. Um, and, and um, you know, the notions, um, the notions of, uh, late, in, later, in later Christianity of, of, of Mary as a sort of womb, uh, womb of Christ. There, there's very similar concepts in the, in, involving the Ark of the Covenant, that it's a sort of, it's a sort of womb containing this powerful energy of, energy of God. There's, a, there's, the, 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 there's, again, a substantial amount of information, and I traced what I thought, uh, I still think, was a, was, a, was a quest on the part of the Knights Templar, uh, which may have led them to Ethiopia uh, looking for this object, uh, but I think not, not obtaining it. Do you think it's still in Ethiopia? Or? I think it's still in Ethiopia, mm-hmm. or I think, at any rate, they have a large part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some in Ethiopia who say it got broken, it got damaged, that something, something was broken off it. Um, but the most recent account of its use uh, comes from Ethiopia. Which was in the 19th century? Or the no? 19th century, the Battle of Adwa, um, when the Italians uh, invaded Ethiopia in the late 19th century, and the Ethiopian emperor of the time Menelik, uh, it is said that the Ark was brought out before his forces as they confronted the Italians. Um, well, the result of that battle was the single largest ever defeat of a, of a European army by an African army in history. Uh, they utterly annihilated the Italians. Although well, it was only the Italians. Huh? Although it was only the Italians. It was only the Italians, <laughs> yes. That's, that's, that's right. I mean, not known for their, not known for their military prowess. Yeah, right. but, uh, but the Ethiopians whipped their ass, you know, really, really badly. And the accounts of the aftermath of that battle sound utterly apocalyptic. And it does, again, it makes you wonder. So, um, 2012, I mean, in, in Fingerprints of the Gods, you propose that, that there may have been foreknowledge of a kind of a literal material catastrophe potentially brought upon by some astronomical mm. thing that could take place. Uh, you know, what are you, what are you feeling now? I mean, since writing that book, you've gone through your own mm. spiritual development, you delved into your own inner psychic... Uh, Dimensions with mm. ayahuasca and yeah. DMT and iboga. So, so now, what does what does 2012 uh, look to you? Look, look like to you? Yeah, it looks it looks quite different. Um, I pay uh, I, I, I pay more attention now um, to how we how we human beings behave and what we do and what we manifest and what we bring down upon ourselves from 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 the universe. Um, I, I don't any longer think it's as simple as some as some kind of um, uh, some, some 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 kind of simple geological accident, which which occurs without any without any spiritual dimension. And as a matter of fact, when you when you do look into the ancient accounts of global cataclysms affecting human civilizations, they all they all say that the behavior of mankind is involved in what comes down on us that we lose the mandate of heaven, that we anger the gods. The Sumerian account of the, of the flood, um, mankind has made the gods furious with noise. They're just making so much noise, and the gods can't bear this bedlam anymore. And, they, and so they decide to... I can sympathize with that. Get rid of us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we are a noisy bunch. And, uh, um, but this may be a, a metaphor for something more, for some, for some kind of, um, you know, some kind of obnoxious and, 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 and awful behavior. So when I, when I look at the world today, I would say that the greatest danger comes not from, not from a, a pole shift or, or, or from being hit by, a, hit by an asteroid, but, but, but simply from, from ourselves and from, and from how we behave and from how we operate towards one another and how we operate towards the planet. Um, and, and I believe if there is a cataclysm coming, it will be a cataclysm that we have created. And since that may be so, then it means that such a cataclysm is not inevitable. We can make a different story. Uh, we, can, we can choose to change our direction. We can make very specific and, 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 and precise changes which would, which would make the world a so much better place to live in. Any reasonable person can, can see this anyway. It's, 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 it's obvious. So it seems, to me, it seems to me that really what we're in right now is a, is a spiritual crisis uh, brought, about by, uh, brought about by the nature of Western technological and industrial society. The whole, the whole problem of, 
of capitalism and the whole problem of socialism too. I mean, when I look at when I look at these two political enemies of the 20th century, the, the capitalists and the, and the communists, for, for example, um, what I actually see, I don't see so much difference between them. Both of them are totally focused on material things. All they're arguing about is how you, how you divide it up. Neither of them is paying any attention to the, to the spiritual nature of man. And so whether, whether it's the capitalist or the communist system, both have, both have undermined uh, the spiritual resources of humanity hugely and undervalued them so much that it almost becomes a joke you know, to talk about spirituality in, in any way. So clearly, uh, we have got terribly out of balance uh, with ourselves and with our, with our own potential. Um, I, I really liked what you were saying during your talk the other day about the um, that we've reduced the only we see the only useful form of consciousness is one that's kind of like a, what do you use problem solving? Yeah, uh, the alert problem solving state of consciousness. Yeah. This is this is what our society values and, and almost deifies to a, to, to, to a level of it's a kind of abstract god. You know, there's just a, this one kind of consciousness which we absolutely adhere and res- uh, we, we, we admire and, and, and respect. And it's very much that state of consciousness that you need to do a lot of science. Perhaps not to get scientific inspiration. But, but to the daily nitty-gritty of science requires that alert problem-solving mentality, as does the daily nitty-gritty of the trading floor in the stock exchange, um, you, as does uh, being a soldier in an army, as does driving a car. Alert problem-solving states of consciousness are kind of, uh, kind of the fundamental um, consciousness state of our society today. And, and then there's a denial that comes along with that of any other kind of state of consciousness. So, so really, our society accepts that we may take a holiday from the alert problem-solving state of consciousness, and that's why it offers us alcohol and reality TV. These are the other states of consciousness that are acceptable within the Western system. But to go beyond that and to look into deeply altered states of consciousness, visionary states, states um, that, that you might require the help of visionary plants to get into, and you find that our society utterly hates and detests those states of consciousness, indeed will send us to prison for exploring our own consciousness uh, in, 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 that, in that way. So, so, I mean, do you think it's likely that um, some type of new foundational paradigm could, could kind of emerge from our present uh, state of chaos? <laughs> I, yes, I think, it, I, think it, I think it must or we're really in trouble. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, have to, we have to shake ourselves out of this, uh, out of this mindset. And, and I do see hope. I see, I see more and more people around the world who are both internally and externally in how they act and what they say are, are rebelling against this paradigm of the, 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 the tyranny of the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. They are, they, are, they are reminding us again, remembering in a way how it was with the ancients, that, they're, that uh, you know, in our culture, it's, if you call somebody a dreamer, you're insulting them. But in, in ancient Egypt or ancient Mesopotamia, a dreaming, a dream, dreaming was a highly regarded state, which was believed to gain access to fundamental truths. Um, I think we need, to, we need to return to that. And I think that I think the visionary plants um, may play a huge role in doing this. We're so locked into this state of consciousness in the West, that many of us, and, and I don't exclude myself from that, um, that we need a, a real jolt to, to get out of it. And, f- and for me, without any shadow of a doubt, it's been uh, ayahuasca, the visionary plants of the Amazon, uh, that have helped to jolt me uh, out of my exclusive focus on that state of consciousness and, and, and required me to think about things in a different way. And I do see ayahuasca spreading her tentacles around the globe and reaching out and touching people in, in every culture and every land, and I see hope in that. Would you recommend that uh, our you know, political and corporate leaders uh, you know, drink these types of, uh, have these types of experiences? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I think that, uh, I mean, I, I, I really think it should be, uh, it should be a, a, an absolute condition of applying for the job of President of the United States or Prime Minister of Britain uh, that you must have logged at least 10 sessions of ayahuasca before you can be considered eligible for that job. Uh, and I actually don't see a downside to that. I mean, I just don't see why that would be, why that would be a problem. But my, uh, it, of course, it would be a problem to people who are so deeply committed to the, to the, to the present state of consciousness. But I have, I have seen ayahuasca work powerful changes 
on not only on my own personality, but on the personality of many, many people that I know. And, and uh, my observation is that those changes are for the better, that they, make, they tend to make people more reflective, gentler, less toxic, more nurturing in the way that they function in the world. And that's what we need from our leaders. We need less toxic, gentler, more nurturing leaders. And I think I would help them a lot. Um, I mean, you know, I wrote a book called 2012, and a lot of people are, you know, sensing crisis oncoming, and there was the whole economic collapse, and, you know, shortages potentially of, like, food and fresh water and all this stuff. You know, you must get some of this. I'm just curious, like, you know, obviously you can tell people, oh, you know, spiritually prepare, drink ayahuasca, do some meditation. But beyond that, I mean, do you, do you yourself feel, and would you recommend to other people, if there's a bunch of, like, tangible things that people should start thinking about and doing right now? Well, this is, this is uh, one of the things that I, that I hugely respect about what, you, what you're doing, because you're taking this out of the talking shop and putting it into, into practical reality with Evolver, for example. Um, really consciously setting out to, to, to at least plant the seeds of a, of a new kind of community, of new ways of people relating to each other. And I, I think that's really important work, um, which, which has not really been done uh, up, up till now. It's, it's very, very important work, because and, and, it's very easy to talk about these things, but talking isn't enough. And, and, and uh, raising consciousness alone isn't enough either. You need action. You need, you need action on the ground. You need, to, you need to, to change the way that people relate to one another. And so I, if I understand correctly, you're looking at, at um, for example, different forms of exchange rather than, I mean, tell me a bit more about it because I... Yeah, um, yeah I mean, we, we have a number of ideas. But one would be um, that, you know, part of the problem of the thing, you know, our society being so unsustainable is embedded in the money mm-hmm. in itself, how it operates, how it's mm-hmm. controlled by private banking consortiums, mm-hmm. how it creates debt and, and creates artificial scarcity and, and enforces competitive behavior. Mm-hmm. So that actually you need alternative ways for people to exchange value mm-hmm. in order to even hope to have a more sustainable mm-hmm. kind of society. So there are a bunch of different, there's like a range of options there. And one would be, you know, different types of complementary currencies. There's, mm-hmm. there's time dollars where people mm-hmm. exchange an hour of anybody's time for an mm-hmm. hour of anybody else's time. But then there's also um, ways you can do uh, you know, mutual credit clearing mm-hmm. through some civic organization mm-hmm. or, or, or uh, clearing, you know, credit house or something that doesn't necessarily need to be mm-hmm. involved with a bank or have an interest. Um, then there's also proposals by this guy, Bernard Lietar, mm-hmm. who was one of the architects of the euro. He's a Belgian, mm-hmm. like, currency specialist, very cool guy. And he talks about how you could have um, negative interest mm-hmm. trading currencies mm-hmm. that actually would be indexed to, like, now our money is like a virtual abstraction. It's not mm. even on the gold standard anymore. Sure. It just kind of floats in relationship to all the other currencies yeah. and so on. Um, it has no tangible or real asset-based value. Mm-hmm. But you can relink a currency to like a basket of real-world goods mm. that like, you know, food and, and fuel and mm. other provisions. And, mm. you know, because, and, and most of, a lot of those things, you know, re- lose value over time. Yeah. You know, which is what happens to stuff in the real world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if you had if you had an index to stuff like that, then you'd have a currency that lost that lost value over time. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. instead of you know impelling people to hold it and mm-hmm, hoard it, mm-hmm. if you had a, if you had a lot of the resource, you would want to share it because the, right. the big value of it would be people remembering that you that you'd help them out. It would completely you know? change the way that that, that, that that people relate to exchange. Actually, yeah, yeah. I mean, and the, and the other thing that occurs to me about about Evolver and, 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 and this, whole, this whole notion is that if indeed we are coming to some kind of fundamental breakdown of Western society, and there has to be a, a, a huge danger of that, if we are, if we are coming to that, then, then people who have prepared themselves in some ways, not, not only psychologically, but also in terms of, 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 of these precise kind of interactions and, and relationships in, in daily life, um, will will be better better able to handle and move forward from that from that collapse than, than those who are in a state of complete denial. And I think taking the kind of practical steps that 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 you and your colleagues are taking in this area a really important thing to do. What do you think will be the future of uh, the the visionary plants and the psychedelics? I hope that uh, I hope that visionary plants and and psychedelics are going to have um, a bright future in, 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 in our societies. I, I think, for me, um, this is an issue I, f- I feel very strongly about. I, I think that the, 
um, I think that we're, we're dealing fundamentally with a human rights issue here. Um, and that is the right of the adult individual to sovereignty over their own consciousness. Um, it, uh, it stuns me that our society, which makes so many claims to freedom, which talks endlessly about the wonders of its democracy, which is constantly trying to impose that model on other cultures all around the world, nevertheless enshrines at its heart uh, an absolutely medieval view of human consciousness, which is that the state can tell us what we may and may not do inside the sanctum of our own heads. This, is, this to me is, is completely uh, insane. And, and, um, and it seems to me that the state is so angry about psychedelics and so ferocious in its, in its persecution of them. This suggests that, uh, that the, the, the state and those who are involved in the state must know how liberating these plants can actually be. That, that, that once people begin to or, go or at down, least they have some intuitive fear of, of that possibility. They have some intuitive <laughs> fear of that possibility. They've not experimented themselves, no. but, uh, but they, they know in their hearts that it can really shake things up and uh, make people begin to question uh, absolutely, absolutely everything. So against this background of fear and state terrorism, nevertheless, over the last 20 years more, in fact, we've seen growing numbers of individuals finding their ways to the visionary plants, and, and uh, undoubtedly it was chaotic in the, 19, in the 1960s, but what I, what I see happening now, um, as we get into the, well into the 21st century, is a, is a realization that this is a very serious matter. That psychedelics are extremely serious uh, issues, and that um, it's not something that you just do for recreation or for fun. It's a rather serious pursuit of, of personal and social inquiry, and that in order to, to work with psychedelics properly, you need to look after the setting and the circumstances in which individuals take psychedelics. Many of the horror stories that happen with psychedelics happen because the individual was unprepared, was in a very negative setting, was in a negative state of mind. And, and, and a, a society which really understood psychedelics um, would, would help people to understand that that's not the, way to, not the way to go. And I'm thinking like Aldous Huxley's Island, you know, mm -hmm. where he envisaged that almost idyllic uh, society where it was a rite of passage to, to, have, a, to have a profound mushroom trip um, at the end of teens and, and, and into adulthood, and where that was treated in a loving and caring and positive way as an, as an essential part of personal growth uh, rather than something to be hated and feared. And you feel that... Um cultures like the Egyptians and the, and the Maya, uh, at least maybe for a small ruling elite, there was um, a kind of uh, you know, diligent pursuit of uh, higher states of consciousness? Yes, I think I'm, I'm certain that there was. Um, uh, the evidence is very clear in Central America. Uh, for ancient mushroom cults, uh, it's very, very, the no, really no, no, no doubt about it. In Egypt, the evidence is less clear. Uh, but if you look at the iconography of ancient Egypt, and particularly the, 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 the abundant presence of, of therianthropes, creatures that are part animal oh. and part human, which we know uh, inhabit the landscape of visionary space, uh, it's clear that the ancient Egyptians were tapping in to the visionary realm. And some good work has been done on, on the possible vehicles that enabled them to do that. Um, and uh, the, 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 the blue lotus uh, mm. is part of that. And, and also, you know, perhaps other, other plants in, in admixture were used. Did you ever read that Paharch book about uh, psychics with, you're working with Amanita muscaria? With, uh, no, I haven't read it's that. It's really I've interesting. It. Yeah. I mean, the psychics, some of them beamed into like uh, past lives as Egyptian right. uh, priests and actually channeled the whole way to do the mushrooms, mm. which included making a salve out of it and putting it on their temples. Mm. Then they started going to like, like very uh, ecstatic, visionary mm. states. And finally, mm. at one point, one of the psychics is it's like, look, I can never do that again because if I go back to that place again, I'm never going to come back here. Right. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, a very, it's, a very, it's a very interesting point. Um, I mean, it's clear. There's a, two things that stand out for, for me just to, to come back to looking at ancient Egypt again is, is with, first of all, their, their extraordinary uh, feats of, of moving around and placing just gigantic blocks of stone that we really can't quite figure out how they did it. And I, and I can't help wondering whether, whether some enhancement of psychic power, uh, perhaps accessed through the visionary realm, may have been involved in this. And secondly, you know, a latent ability that we all have 
but that's been shut down by our society because our society tells us you know we can only move things with mechanical advantage and the te- and leverage and the, the, the technological fix the, the, the power of the mind can't do that whereas I think it was very different in in ancient Egypt and the and the other thing is the in, the investigation of the whole mystery of death that you find in ancient Egypt and 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 the sense that uh, the abs- not just a sense but absolute clarity that that death is not the end and that there's a whole journey that goes on beyond that. In a way, it's the beginning of the next great adventure. And, uh, you know, the ancient Egyptians, um, as I said the other night, they, they, they put their best minds to work on this problem for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. And what do we put our best mm-hmm. minds to work on? You right. know, how to make a, a, another kind of motor car or a better kind of washing powder. This is the, the, the trivia that we focus on, or, or high-grade weapons. You know, this is mm-hmm. what we focus our intelligence on. So no wonder we're in such a horrific mess. And I think, I think the visionary plants are rightly seen as allies, they're our allies, they're our companions, they've co-evolved with us on this planet, and they offer us the chance to step back and think again, however deeply we are immersed in, in this material, quote-unquote, reality. What are you seeing in uh, England right now in regards to uh, climate change? Huh. Well, in England we have, as you do in America, um, the, the 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 view that that um, the, the 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 whole notion of global warming may be may be slightly more complicated than it's than it's presented uh, to be. Uh, m- m- most people um, buy completely into the prevailing picture. Clearly, climate is changing. The, the the question is the question is exactly why it's changing and and what role we're playing in it. And I my own view. For, for what it's worth, and I'm not a climate uh, expert, I'm, I've just observed this debate as it's going on, and I've done, I've done a fair amount of work on the last ice age. Um, my own view is that probably we are a trigger factor rather than a full-scale cause of, of what is happening now, because there's absolutely no doubt, if you go back 125, 130,000 years to before the last ice age began, um, that you find yourself in a period of gigantic climate instability where, where global temperature changes of the order of t- 10 degrees centigrade were not abnormal. Um, and yet, supposedly, there was no industrial pollution at that time. So there must be something else going on, something at the level of the solar system, something at the level of the universe, which is, which is uh, connected to this. But none of this is to say that we shouldn't fix mm-hmm. the way we live and relate to on this planet. I think, I think in a way... It's, it, it, it's, it's better to say our current pattern of consumption is absolutely not sustainable and is, and is utterly destructive in every way. And we need to fix that because it needs to be fixed, because it's just wrong mm-hmm. to go on functioning like that, rather than, rather than, than, than trying to create this huge um, you know, sort of stick held over us and saying that we are causing all of this climate change. I think a lot of people reject that, who might be reached much more convincingly, might be much more convinced um, that, that it's the right thing to do anyway. We need to, we need to radically change the way that we consume and produce. There's just no doubt about that, whether or not doing that is causing climate change. Mm-hmm. Well, what I mean, do you think? I mean, um, I think it seems likely that um, um, we're causing less of it than we think yeah. and that there's some solar system-wide change going on mm-hmm. that involves... I mean, the, you know, the Russian physicist Dmitry talks about that the whole solar system seems to be undergoing a transition right now, mm-hmm. like these planets are developing atmospheres, yes. having many yeah. like, pole shifts, the sun is behaving very abnormally, yeah. Yeah. there's been a decrease in the energy of the, the heliosphere, right. I guess, um, and very, like, you know, sudden jolts of, mm-hmm. of powerful solar energy, uh, mm-hmm. you know, flares and so on. Um, but uh, the question is, you know, how psychophysical is, is the whole scenario? Mm-hmm. Like, is it somehow, um, you know, linked to this evolutionary process of human consciousness? I mean, are we emitting, you know, electromagnetic energies that feed the newest sphere, mm-hmm. which then interact with the sun mm-hmm. and the larger field? Mm-hmm. Um, so um, I would be inclined to think we are. Yeah, uh, I, I, I've I've come to realize, you know, more more and more that that that, that thought is a thing, and 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 that uh, that we actually do need to be careful what we think about and dwell on 
and 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 the kind of games that we that we that we play because it's very very serious matter, um, and and uh, I, I I don't rule out at all that that um, that things can be brought into manifestation through thought. What do you think of the whole you know construct of there being some kind of controlling? force that's limiting consciousness on the planet that maybe has a certain intention with mm. developing technologies that are kind of really ultimately destructive yeah. to human beings. I mean, uh, that maybe works through, you know, Hollywood and mega corporations yes. and military industrial complexes. I, I think it's highly likely. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, I, I go back to, to my own studies and my own research and, and particularly looking at the, at the Gnostic and, 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 and the, the Hermetic texts. Um, in the Gnostic texts, there's a there's a notion that the the guy we call God or Yahweh or Jehovah or whatever we want to want to call him, he's not a good guy at all. He's he's not even a god. Right. He's a, he's a sort of demon, and 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 he has with a huge ego, and he he's imposed himself on mankind and misled us into into the worship of him, um, and led us down a track that we were never meant to go on. And and the Gnostics did see a um, well, they were profoundly dualistic. They did see a, 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 a battle of good and evil uh, operating in the universe, across the, across the entire universe. And curiously, they felt that, uh, that mankind was the fulcrum of this cosmic struggle and that, and that what we do and that the choices we make, either for the light or for the dark, either for good or for evil, uh, rebound not just within our sphere, not just on this planet, but, but across the whole universe, and that, and that spiritual entities are drawn into this struggle, some seeking to push us in one direction, some seeking to push us in others. Um, and the left to us is choice. And I guess that's what, what I'd like to come back to at the, at, at the end of this, that, that we can still choose. We are not abject and helpless. The answer to this problem, just as the making of it, I believe, is in our own hands. Mm -hmm. um, another idea I've heard around 2012, which I think is an interesting one, and this is Marx's kind of theory, mm -hmm. is that um, it represents a shift from a kind of, um, first we have obviously a geocentric perspective, at mm -hmm. least in Europe, uh, although it's unclear, I guess, if these older civilizations had that or if they understood that we were circling the sun. I think they did. Yeah. It's pretty clear, good, pretty clear the Egyptians knew that the sun was the center of the okay. solar okay. system. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, we, we then shifted to the heliocentric perspective, mm -hmm. and 2012 could re represent a shift to a galactocentric uh, mm. perspective. Mm. You know? Nice idea. Yeah, because suddenly we're um, recognizing that the dark rift at the center of the Milky Way is actually our orientation point you mm -hmm. know, around which mm -hmm. we're, we're swinging. Yeah. Uh, and that that would have kind of effects on, you know, our activities and our awareness that were as profound as that shift yeah. into a heliocentric yeah. you know, worldview. Yeah, shift the entire reference frame from, mm -hmm. which, we, from which we look at, at everything, and, and maybe that's ex exactly what's needed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I first came across Daniel Pinchbeck in an absolutely mind-blowing, eye-opening book called Breaking Open the Head. What was Daniel Pinchbeck doing before he wrote Breaking Up in the Head. And um, how did that lead to writing such an extraordinary book? Oh, um, I'd been working as a journalist. I was writing for the New York Times Magazine and Esquire, but I kind of got very like kind of depressed and, and mopey in New York. I went through an existential crisis. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I'd been working on novels. I also had been trying to write about like ecological, environmental crises, but had found that... Um, the magazines weren't really interested in that unless it was had some weird, funny hook to it. I just felt really, really kind of uh, lost. And I remembered uh, psychedelic experiences that I'd had in college. Uh, but I'd grown up in a you know, scientific materialist culture. Um, so I'd never really thought that there was any other dimensions of, of spiritual experience. But those psychedelic journeys with mushrooms and LSD had suggested that... Um, you know, maybe there were um, other things going on. So I got excited to just delve into that. And then it just turned out to be, like, you know, the thing that I was meant to do. <laughs> I mean, did you, did you set out at the beginning of that inquiry 
very consciously in mind that you were going to write a book about it? Or, or When I went down to West Africa and went through the Iboga initiation, I, 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 at that point I, I knew that it, it should and, and, and could be a book. Um, I, I then got really lucky. I had a year fellowship at, at Columbia University in this thing called the National Arts Journalism Program where I really was able to put a lot of the tools together, um, especially a class I took in the uh, rhetoric of uh, kind of nonfiction mm -hmm. literature uh, where we analyzed how people like Virginia Woolf and George Orwell mm -hmm. and um, I guess Nabokov, I don't remember, put together nonfiction books um, that, that, that really helped me organize how to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, my one experience with, with you, you, you describe uh, your experiences with uh, with Iboga and indeed your West West African journey. My my one experience with with Iboga was with the the, the, the extract with with with, with Ibogaine, and I, I took it in my my own home under the guidance of a healer. Now you went um, uh, the route of traveling down to West Africa and and working with the with the Buiti. Just tell me a bit about how that that happened. How did you? How did you make that contact? Was it your first time to Africa? What did it feel like when you when you got there? How did you find yourself in a setting where you were taking Iboga with uh, with the with the Buiti? I believe it was with the yeah. With the Buiti. Uh, I got an assignment from a magazine called uh, Vibe. I had a friend who was an editor there, and I think he saw it as kind of like I don't know, like almost like a joke or something like that. I, that he would send me and give me all this money to go down there. <laughs> Um, and, uh, but I, you know, I told him that it had anti-addictive properties, you know, whatever. So, and I had, you know, I was very poor at that point. So like, um, you know, it was pretty extravagant for me to like get down to Africa for this thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I got to Africa. I, I, I don't remember how I found, uh, Dan Lieberman. I must've found him through the internet. Right. And he was supposed to meet me at the airport, but then the plane got delayed a day in, in Paris. I didn't even know if he was going to be there. And then Libreville felt very kind of, um, kind of, you know, I met him at the airport. Libreville felt very um, static, mm -hmm. um, very um, alien in a way. And I never, I'd never been to Africa before. Um, and then, um, yeah, we went to um, Lamborghini and uh, <clears throat> met up with this uh, shaman who was quite a kind of macho character. Um, I don't know, it, the whole thing had a slightly fictional quality to me from, from the outset. Mm -hmm. Like I kind of stepped into another dimension, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, and I think in a way that made me feel kind of protected, even though there were kind of um, difficult moments, mm -hmm. even dealing with the shaman, who at one point was like demanding more money from us and waving, one of his kids was like waving a gun around or whatever. But uh, somehow I felt like I was going to be protected through the whole experience. So you didn't find that threatening? I don't know. As I said, it really felt like I'd stepped into like another yeah. uh, reality, which I felt a few times. I felt the same way probably when I went to Ecuador or even to Brazil. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's felt like a kind of hyper-reality state, you know. I mean, just, just, just briefly, what, how, how would you summarize, how would you encapsulate that, uh, that Iboga experience? You took, it, you took the root bark mm -hmm. uh, in quite a high dose. I, I, yeah, I, I ate a whole bunch of it whole bunch of it yeah. and what happens next I mean what, what's your setting when you're doing this you're, you're sitting in a hut you're uh, well, they, they bring us down to the river like, I had to take off all my clothes go into the river it was like an initiation then you wear their clothes their like, little robe and they smear this like medicinal paste on you and uh, then you kind of wait and I waited quite a long time uh, before anything happened and they kept feeding me this stuff which was incredibly nasty tasting but, th but then when it, when, the, when it came on uh, it felt like they had a very clear understanding of a number of phases that the experience would have that included having your eyes open and looking into a mirror and seeing things manifest in the mirror um, and then lying down and going into more of the, the psychoanalytic uh, aspect of it. And, and I, I guess for me, um, from this vantage point, it's been a long time now, um, that, that whole psychoanalytic kind of um, element of it uh, was the most amazing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. making making you confront elements of your of yourself. You mean the press yeah? I, just, I felt like I was taken on a tour through my different mm. past experiences, early childhood, and stuff like that. Don't you think it's a it's a tremendous mystery that uh, that certain plants, which definitely have visionary properties, also have this uh, this uh, this ability to 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 make us confront ourselves in a way that we don't. I, uh, Iboga and of course ayahuasca as well. What do you think is going on? I mean, why? How, we wouldn't 
automatically expect this of a plant mm -hmm. or, of, or of anything, and yet, and yet it's very, very consistent in the experience yeah. of many people. Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's an incredible mystery that you and I are sitting here with how many, tri 70 trillion cells or mm -hmm. something like that, mm -hmm. and, um, Just you know, to be alive at all. Yeah, exactly, and each, each one of them is its own, you know, has its own thing going on, and every DNA can be coiled out to reach mm -hmm. the moon or something like that. I mean, the whole thing is kind of puzzling, right? Mm -hmm. um, so... You know, I, I, the, the way I really like to look at it is from a friend of mine, Morgan Brent, who's a um, herbalist, and he talks about how, you know, we, we've kind of hubristically developed the idea that we're at the top of this pyramid of life, that humanity is the top of this pyramid, and, you know, everything else is beneath us in terms of consciousness and awareness, but actually, if you were to squish that down, you would see that we're like a kind of, in terms of the, you know, amount of time we've been on the planet, we're just this, you know, we've hardly been here at all. We're just a little mm -hmm. pinprick yeah. compared to this much elder community of life. Mm -hmm. And that it's only our, you know, kind of arrogance that would assume, you know, we have something, you know, that's tremendously distinct in terms of consciousness. And maybe there's other types of consciousness that it just expresses itself in other ways. It's not as like mobile, you know, doesn't need to build technologies in the same way we do. So his idea is that um, the plant realm you know, being like an elder community of life on the planet, uh, you know, they, they recognize that we, the human beings, are going through our kind of adolescent initiatory journey as a species. So they kind of designated uh, certain members of their community to be kind of diplomats and, and uh, you know, teachers, uh, you know, w with us. And uh, that's what the psychedelic uh, plants are. And, and it does seem like, you know, when you um, ingest them, you, you get a lot of messages about how to kind of reintegrate into the larger community of life, you know, how to let go of your ego, how not to act in ways that, you know, cause as much problems and so on. You know. um, it, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very curious thing um, that, that, uh, you know, that the, the, the plants should somehow, should somehow do that. And it's a sense that, that, that what you were touching on there is this, the, the, the sense that, uh, which we absolutely do not have in Western technological society, that plants are also conscious entities. And you come into the, into the shamanic realms there, where for, for shamans in hunter-gatherer societies, it's, it's, abs it's absolutely obvious, certainly with the case of ayahuasca, that there is an intelligent entity behind it. And I believe that's the case with the, with the Bwiti, uh, as, with, with Iboga as well. I mean, do you see it that way? Do you, do you, do you, when you talk about, if we, we talk about a figure like Mother Ayahuasca, who many people have encountered either in the form of a woman or in the form of a, of a serpent. What do you think is going on there? Do you think there really is, that there is an entity, an intelligent entity, a being, a bit like you and I, but, but also very different? Or, or, or something else. I mean, what, what's happening there? Uh, it, it seems like there's certainly like a personality. Like the, there seems to be different personalities with the aboga and the ayahuasca and the mushrooms. Uh, you know, and sometimes you get the sense of more like a collective intelligence that it's like, um, yeah, so it's, it wouldn't be you know, it wouldn't be really singular um, in the same way as we conceive of ourselves. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, especially with the mushrooms, you get the sense of like a, a group identity coming mm -hmm. to communicate with you. I guess with the boga, it felt a little bit more singular, almost like a, a particular kind of like father type being who, you know, is is very tough and doesn't want to let you get away with your normal crap. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, I mean, bearing in mind your your personal experiences with the with these plants, what I'm going to turn around a question you asked me a little bit a little mm -hmm. bit earlier. What what do you see as the future of the psychedelics of the of the visionary plants in 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 our society? Are they are we going anywhere with them? Are they going anywhere with us? What what happens next? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's hard to say. I, mean, I don't know what's you know possible or what's really going to happen. I mean, you know, it, it could be that um, we we're about to hit a major crisis for global civilization, and people aren't going to know how to deal with it. Um, and people have gotten trapped in a kind of ego structure where they identify with their egos entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of, one of the best ways to shake people out of that, you know, is the psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. So, it, and it may be that there's now enough, you know, people, even authority people and scientists and psychoanalysts and medical people around who understand the value and validity of these experiences that it, that it could much more quickly than, than we can actually um, expect, you know, it could become validated, uh, you know, culturally and, and you know, through, uh, through authority structures. Or, um, 
and maybe that those authority structures are just going to begin to collapse mm -hmm. as, as things disintegrate. Mm -hmm. um, there's not going to be the money to pay the armies and run the courts and keep millions of people in prison for drug offenses. It's mm -hmm. going to become more anarchic. And then in, in that type of social situation, you know, maybe the psychedelics would be you, you could be used on a larger scale to help people attain a different perception of, of, of what's happening and what, and what they are in relationship to the cosmos. What do you say to, the, to those individuals, and this, this is a criticism that's been leveled at me uh, m many times as I've been giving talks and, and, and with people I bump into, um, who, who they, they, they take the line that, that psychedelics are somehow, that somehow, that it's a low-level way to enter the visionary state, that, that it's somehow not pure or not, or not proper, and they keep using the word natural. I keep, people, people keep saying to me, it's okay to get visions, but you have to do it naturally, mm -hmm. not with psychedelics. And, I, and my, my answer to that tends to be, I can't think of anything more natural than a, than, than a plant. But mm -hmm. I wonder what your take on that, that whole thing is. I'm sure you must have heard the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't really, like, that critique doesn't really mean much to me. I mean, I mean, first of all, you look, there's a whole range of techniques that people use to get into ordinary states of, non-ordinary states of consciousness, and, you know, they, they involve somehow or other, you know, changing your temporary balance of chemicals or oxygen or whatever, so it could be fasting or, you know, extreme pain or uh, dark meditation, which apparently releases more DMT in the brain. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think there's a whole continuum of these practices. Mm -hmm. I mean, another th thing that people always say is that, oh, you shouldn't do that, it's a shortcut. Yeah. But the answer to that is, what's wrong with shortcuts? Yeah. Like, if I want to get, you know, from here to, you know, someplace else, and I have a choice between a very long, boring route or a shortcut, I'm going to take the shortcut. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, why walk when you can take the train? Yeah. Yeah, no, this is, uh, this, this, is, this is fair enough. But, but I think that, you know, a shift in, in, you know, maybe perception from the 60s is that, you know, not saying that these things are the answer, but they're tools, and that, you know, for me, like, the value of any particular experience is not just in what people say about the experience or what they think happened to them, but how they actually behave, you know, yeah. what they actually do in the, in, the, in the days, months, and even years afterwards. How they integrated into their lives. Yeah, and, and, and that's what I really like about, like, I've been watching a lot of people I know involved in the Santo Daime mm -hmm. uh, in, in the U.S., and over time I see consistent... Uh, positive changes mm -hmm. in their behavior, which is that they become, you know, more empathic, mm -hmm. more intelligent, you know, functioning better, you know, happier, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, so those seem to be very consistent and, and right. legitimate changes. Yeah, yeah. and extremely, <clears throat> extremely positive. Yeah. Now, moving on from from psychedelics and, and, and breaking up in the head, uh, your next book is 2012: The Return of Quetzalcoatl, uh, another extraordinary uh, piece of work. Um, but uh, at least looking at it from, from the outside, quite, quite different from, from, from breaking up in the head. Tell me a bit about the process. How did, how did that happen? How did you, did you move from one theme to another? And is it really a movement or other themes integrated? Yeah, I mean, I did at the end of breaking up in the head, you know, in, talk about the idea of 2012, I think in relationship to Terence McKenna's work. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, when you have psychedelic experiences, <clears throat> they can give you a very strong in, in, insight into how society, you know, the, its present organization is, is not, you know, it's, it's transitory. It's, it's, it's one way that things could be, maybe not the best or most ideal way. And, and, you know, that coupled with realizing that our society is very unsustainable and the principles it's, it's you know, built on are, are, you know, beginning to lead to a kind of decay, a rapid degeneration maybe, um, you know, then led me into thinking about what indigenous cultures say about this time, you know, what, what, our, what our visionaries like McKenna and Jose Arguelles have kind of figured out in, in relating to, the, to, the, to those prophecies. So then I just got, you know, very fascinated with um, trying to understand, you know, if, if these ideas had validity mm -hmm. and if our society was to go through a massive paradigm shift, you know, what would be on the other side of that? How would we begin to define it or look towards it? You know, what type of shift in consciousness might we, might we see? Mm -hmm. I mean, what brought you to, to, to 2012 specifically, to that, that date and the Mayan, the Mayan calendar? was. Well, first it was McKenna's work, and then it was, um, when I read Arguelles' work, but then I had um, some synchronicities around it. One was um, uh, 9-11, 2001, where I was editing. I, I had a friend that had written a book that I was going to publish at a little publishing house. Uh, it was a poem where he talked about 
2012 maybe disintegrating into like a road warrior scenario after that and everybody fighting for oil and, and he talked about ayahuasca and some other stuff and I, and I just started editing his book I opened up the manuscript on the morning of 9-11 I've been working on it for like an hour or two with the planes at the building and his book was called World on Fire and then a few months later I got Arguelles' Time in the Technosphere in, in the mail or maybe it was six months later and I just had a number of synchronicities I, I did a little piece on the crop circles one of the people who I interviewed for that piece, who'd been studying them for years, said that in his mind, the, these formations were pointing towards um, uh, a dimensional shift that was going to happen that had begun in you know, 1999 or something and was going to culminate in 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I just kept getting indications that, that this needed to be mm -hmm. focused on. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You've spent quite a bit of time in crop circles... Yeah, I, I did spend. Yeah, um, mainly around Wiltshire in, yeah. in England. Any yeah. other countries or, or the English ones? There's not just, many. Just else, the English ones. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, just tell me about the first time you went into a crop circle and what you felt. So I'd, I'd written a piece for Wired magazine about them, and then I went to a crop circle conference, mm -hmm. and uh, I was on a bus, and it, was, it must have been two thousand, the summer of two thousand uh, two, I guess two thousand yeah, two thousand two. And um, we were taken to a crop circle, and I was shown an image uh, of it from above, mm -hmm. and it was very eerie to me, because as I, as I looked at the image, it seemed um, very connected with the work I'd been doing on, on my book, Breaking Open the Head, which hadn't been released yet, as it showed a kind of like double mushroom uh, kind, of, kind of glyph, which could be read as Amanita on one side, and psilocybin on the other, or as the Tree of Life, or as this early Christian... Mushroom cult that John Allegro walks, uh, talks about, where they used Amanita uh, in their frescoes and so on. And then when I entered the, the crop circle, there was definitely a palpable energy shift. It, it had just appeared the night before. I saw people with dowsing pendulums or pulling skewed way off the other direction. And the first person I started talking to um, turned, developed into being one of my best friends in the whole uh, area. This, this this guy Alan Brown. I actually just did an amazing book on sacred geometry that he illustrated that was John Michel's uh, last book. Right, yeah. right, right, right. So it just kept opening like that as, yes. as, I, as I delved into it. You know. um, is it possible to, to summarize in f f f relatively few words what, what, the, what the essential thesis of your book 2012 is and, and, and also the subtitle, The Return of Quetzalcoatl? Mm -hmm. why, why that subtitle? Uh, yeah, well, this, I'll start with the subtitle. Uh, Quetzalcoatl is a, um, you know, Aztec uh, name for a crater deity who's known in the Mayan language as Cacolcocan, and it's the feathered serpent, the plume serpent, so it's the meeting of the bird and the snake, which is also the, you know, could be seen as the meeting of heaven and earth, uh, air and matter, spirit and matter, but also what I argue in the, in the, in the book as a theory is it could also symbolize the integration of, uh, you know, previously seemingly opposed uh, opposites. In this case, the, uh, you know, Western materialist scientific knowledge system uh, with, you know, which would be kind of the earth, the material-based one, with more of this intuitive, shamanic, or Eastern mystical uh, way of knowing reality. And I think that as these two forms of knowing are, are melding and coming together, it's, it's leading towards this next form of consciousness. Uh, so that was one element, and the other element was that's a, was the return, the return, the return of, of Quetzalcoatl, symbolizing, that. symbolizing yeah. 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 And then the other element for me personally was an experience that I'd had in the in Brazil, in the Amazon, where I received this uh, transmission of prophecy, this voice speaking in my head that proclaimed that it was Quetzalcoatl, that this was the apocalypse, that I had this mission to get out these ideas and information and stuff like that. Um, so it had resonance for me both. Symbolically, and then more of this personal experience. And that, and that, um, that experience. Did that? Were, were you drinking ayahuasca? At that yes, time? I was drinking ayahuasca. So it, was, it started an, an started ayahuasca during vision. a daime, a curmudgeonly daime experience, mm -hmm. where I was kind of not enjoying the whole scenario of mm -hmm. the religion and everything. I was kind of cursing the whole thing out, and then this voice started speaking to me, and then mm -hmm. stayed with me off and on for the next week as we journeyed into the Amazon. Right, <clears throat> right, right. Um, I mean, it's a, a, another curious aspect of of, um, of these uh, of these visionary plants is is the incredible sort of contribution to to creativity. We see it a lot with with visionary artists, Martina Hoffman and Robert Bonosa, uh, 
of Alex Gray. Um, would you say that your encounters and your work with, with psychedelics like ayahuasca, like, uh, like Iboga, have, um, have affected your creativity? Oh, yeah, I, I mean, <clears throat> definitely the two books I, I read were, um, uh, you know, response, responding to the, uh, you know, power and influence of, of, of these of these uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that somehow I became much more intelligent and, um, you know, more facile with language mm -hmm. as a result of, of working with, the, with these compounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've I've also found a, a, a huge boost to my to my mm -hmm. creativity since 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 working with these with these compounds. Okay, so so 2012, the return of Quetzalcoatl. You're you're introducing some some very radical ideas uh, into the world. Um, and since then, since you've finished that book, you've you've gone on, I think, to take some rather practical steps to to implement. Those, those ideas of, of which um, it, it seems to me the, mo the most obvious is uh, Evolver and what is um, what you're what you're doing with Evolver so just tell me a bit more about that what 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 exactly what, where did the germ of the idea for for Evolver come from where has it got to now mm -hmm. where do you hope that it will go to and what are you doing with it right uh, yeah I mean it's been a you know many leveled process I mean um, I guess um, you know, I had a breaking up in the head discussion board uh, and was amazed by the level of engagement that people had. And, and then I started to get so many um, emails from people who had extraordinary ideas and stories and anecdotes. And so I wanted to, you know, construct a media forum, you know, where people could, in a professional way, delve deeper into these ideas and, and get them out into the world. So that, that led to Reality Sandwich, uh, which is our web magazine. Uh, Evolver, I, I got involved with a company in Los Angeles that included uh, these um, these guys who, you know, wanted to start a sort of transformational company. Mm -hmm. And we went to a certain level with it and then it kind of fell apart. But a lot of those ideas I then held on to and resuscitated uh, for for uh, Evolver. What, one idea that interested me uh, was, you know, if you look at alchemy, they talk about taking poisons and transforming them into medicines. Mm -hmm. So if you look at corporations, like the corporate form has been, uh, you know, kind of a devastating poison on the planet, mm -hmm. but it's also been the most powerful agent for, you know, transforming matter, transforming cultures and so on. So, you know, if it's been such a poison, alchemically, there should be a way to make it into a, a medicine. Right. So we, we've sort of been, that's why we did it as a for-profit rather than a non-profit, to really see if there was some way to turn around the logic of, of mm -hmm. the corporate structure. And it's definitely been very, very challenging, uh, you know, project. But, yeah, some of our ideas were to create a social network where local communities could plug into this whole new paradigm that, you know, included, you know, the farthest reaches of consciousness, psychic phenomena, but then much more practical things like, you know, sustainable business, you know, local permaculture, alternative economic models, mm -hmm. Uh, now, now we're looking at um, a, a developing a membership model, maybe even having a card that will that will link people to like local and sustainable businesses in their area. But then we'll just hopefully we'll be able to keep growing this network and then and then feed people who are part of the network new ideas, new new possibilities, link them with projects that that uh, help build some kind of alternative community. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, this this notion of the evolver spores, which, as I understand it, is is groups of people in different places around the world mm -hmm. who are who are mm -hmm. actively pursuing and, and following these ideas and taking 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 them further. Um, just tell me a bit more about about that. Does it, I mean, would it be is, is it like a, a a new network of friends? If I were if I were part of Evolver and I found myself I don't know going to some distant city in another in another land that I need, hadn't been to before, would I would I feel comfortable in calling up one of the the people that I'd met through Evolver and maybe sleeping on their couch? Or yeah, I mean, I hope that people use it that way. Uh, you know, I mean, it's now been going for about six seven months. So it's still developing. Uh, maybe a little long, longer than that, actually. But um, yeah, we're seeing. I think we have like forty groups. You know, some in the U.S., few in the U.K., and other and internationally, other places. Uh, we create a theme in a, in a kind of feedback communication with the regional co co coordinators. Uh, we create a template for the event, and then they bring in 
you know, screenings of little films, speakers on different subjects. So this is um, getting out of the, 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 the electronic world. People are meeting physically in, right. in a place. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're using the, the virtual world to facilitate kind of the building of an offline and, and real world, uh, you know, connectivity. Mm -hmm. you know? And is there a, is there, is there a centralized structure which is suggesting what the topic? Yeah, I, I guess what we've been trying to do, and that, that's what the, 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 the social media uh, allows for, is, is really trying to find this juncture between, you know, some kind of helpful centralized structure and self-organization. Right. You know, because because mostly people, you know. It's easier for most people to participate in something that exists and has some kind of structure than just to start from scratch. You know, so, we're, so we're trying to give them enough of a structure so that they really enjoy plugging in and feel it's like to their you know, benefit, that, that they learn and that they gain from, from building the community um, you know, without, without, without hampering them from, from doing what they want to do with it. You know? I mean, so, how do you avoid the risks of hierarchy in a, in a situation like that? Um, well, I mean, one way is that it's just strictly voluntary. If people don't like what we're doing, you know, they can go elsewhere, you know. Sure. I mean, it's kind of like um, the open source model in software development. You know, like anybody can plug into helping to build some new piece of software, but there is a project manager. There's somebody who's running the show and making mm -hmm. the decisions. And if those people, ultimately, if enough of them don't like the decisions that are being made, they can go and do their own version of it, you know. And then if they do, we're happy with that, and we'll ask them to come and speak at another event if they want to, you know. Yeah. How many of you are working with Evolver at the moment? Uh, it's probably like, I don't know exactly, five or six people who work some part-time, some full-time, but then there are all these uh, coordinators, right. you know, and... And, and the coordinators are, are volunteers? Vo volunteer, but we're hoping uh, with this membership card program that we can start finding ways to pay them mm -hmm. to be involved and to help build the network to the next level. Mm -hmm. And in terms of your, your life as a, as, as a writer, as a, as, as, as a creator... And also, you know, clearly as a as, as a social activist, which what, how's the balance going now? Where what what ooh. I know as a writer that it's very difficult for me to write yeah. um, when I'm engaged in a lot of social social activities or or even giving a lot of talks, and uh, and I'm just wondering how this how this is impinging on and on what you see as your central role. Are you centrally first and foremost a, a writer, or or are you something else? Um. Yeah, we, we, we discussed this the other day, but it's been a big problem. I have an overdue book contract, mm -hmm. and, you know, because there was this project and also um, a documentary film that I've been working on, and um, um, I still feel that, that the writing is, is the core activity because it generates things that are kind of new, you know, and, and to get to that place for me requires a deep immersion. Uh, so... It's been frust frustrating because I keep trying to clear the space for it. The space is not as clear as it used to be, um, so I'm, I'm still trying to work that out. It must be it must be extremely extremely difficult to to, to manage all of that. I would have thought it's it's definitely been an, uh, over over I'm overmatched with the challenge at this particular moment. Yeah. <laughs> what is your next book about? Uh, well, I was interested in um, what it would mean if, if there's some legitimacy to you know whatever, 2012 or thereabouts, that we're being forced into a, um, you know, fairly radical change in, in social paradigm. Uh, you know, the, the, there's all these New Age people who talk about ascension, or like David Wilcock, who you recently had as a house guest, talks about, you know, our DNA is going to... Maybe that's going to happen. But it seems to me that that negates or neglects a, a real history of, of social and political struggle that's been happening you know, for thousands of years of people who are kind of under the uh, domination of, of a kind of empire. That's, mm -hmm. that's a military empire that, you know, sucks resources up to a very narrow, tiny group. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm just interested if um, in the idea that a social and political transformation needs, needs to happen, you know, on a global level, and that the same threshold shift into, an, into a new level of consciousness would... Uh, would be reflected in new social and political and economic structures. Right. And then the question is, you know, not only theoretically what those would look like, mm -hmm. but how do we tactically make those happen? Mm -hmm. You know, so in a way, Evolver, you know, is a necessary laboratory right. to begin to understand, you know, what's, what's possible uh, with that. Um, you know, I mean, so, so yeah, so the book was really looking at 
um, you know, how to bring about a, a social transformation. Right. Um, and breaking that down into different areas, like looking at how uh, the media constructs subjectivity and conditions and limits consciousness. Uh, so then, you know, w would it be possible to create a different type of media that produces a different type of subjectivity, a more, a more engaged, mm -hmm. less kind of pacified and consumer type of type of consciousness? Mm -hmm. so questions like that. Right. Yeah. Right. And then and then also, um, you know, the Buckminster Fuller approach, I think, is also very interesting, looking at social problems and even this whole process as, as a design problem, you know, that our, that our society is a design prototype that's now breaking down as all design prototypes do. So what's the next prototype, you know? So here we are. It's uh, January 2010. Um, we're coming up to, to that year, which is picked out in, in the Mayan calendar as a... Well, we're not sure exactly what they're saying. Are they saying that a great cataclysm is going to strike the earth? Are they saying that that a huge surge and change in, in consciousness will, will occur? Um, it's not absolutely clear, but one thing that is clear is that a lot of people uh, in the world today, almost, almost with a, a horrific kind of glee, seem to be embracing and welcoming the notion of cataclysm. Uh, and we see this in Hollywood, and we see it in novels, and we see it uh, all over popular culture right now. Do you think there's dangers in that? Do you think, do you think by, by <coughs> envisaging and dwelling on the cataclysm, we, we might make it happen? Um, yeah, I think it's possible. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it seems likely that we're going to get some level of disaster coming up. I mean... Um, um, sort of hard to say how much. What I'm more and more attracted to is the idea of using that uh, sort of taking, you know, taking that December 21st, 2012 meme and, and turning it around. Mm -hmm. My friend Mark Healy has, has, is developing this idea of a Peace 2012 movement mm -hmm. where you set a <clears throat> time on that day where you ask people to, you know, organize some event and then do a, a peace meditation. Mm -hmm. And, I, and we've been having talks with people around this, this conference and other festivals and Earth Dance are involved. And I think that that's an idea. If we can get that ball rolling right now, it could be really powerful. Because maybe, you know, rather than just drifting towards, you know, some kind of d deeper disaster, you know, we could actually use that, that the interest in that mm -hmm. date as, as a focusing event for human consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and as Mark points out, there's, there seems to be actual, you know, evidence, data that, that, that supports the, uh, you know, the, 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 the value of, uh, you know, positive focusing events. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he can talk about it better than I can, but, you know, there was a, there was a time of prayer after 9-11 right. that was also registered by the Global Consciousness Project as, as, a, as a higher coherence uh, kind of event. And for those who are not familiar with it, the Global Consciousness Project is, is what exactly? Uh, Princeton University put, uh, I think, 50 random number generators in cities around the planet. They've done enough st studies to know that human consciousness can uh, affect uh, the generation of, of random numbers. The theory is that these machines should just pump out numbers in a totally random yeah, way. Yeah, exactly. And so they discovered that around major events, there's there's a, a deviation from from you know normal random patterns in some one direction or other, and um, for instance, the, the largest deviation they ever experienced was 9/11, right. and at that point it happened. Uh, uh, it be, the, the 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 change from normal patterns started se several hours uh, before the planes hit the building. Right, right. Um, well, that's huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And and then the, the I think they call it the Maharishi effect, yeah. where, where sort of pr prayer or meditation is is offered up, and, and somehow violent and, and, and antisocial behavior d d declines. It seems there's something real to, to measure and, 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 and count in mm -hmm. a way. Exactly. So so the thought would be to bring together, hopefully, large numbers of people all around the world um, on the twenty first of December mm -hmm. date, mm -hmm. two thousand and twelve. Mm -hmm. Why not before? Why not start right right now doing that? Perhaps he is doing that. I, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, you can start a build-up, but I think it's, mm. it's good to have a, like a focusing 
event or a deadline. Mm -hmm. And I think also if you did want to do maybe some, along with that, some larger concert type shows similar to like, you know, Live Aid or the one that Al Gore did, mm -hmm. you're going to need a couple years of preparation. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, then the whole thing is, I mean, his whole, whole idea is that people need to do it themselves, kind of activate their own like electromagnetic energy fields and so on. Uh, and I think there are people who are prepared for that, but there are a lot of people who are still in a more passive mm -hmm. mindset. So, so maybe other ways to introduce um, these concepts to them in some way that's familiar to them with celebrities and so on could, mm -hmm. could be used. So is that where you're going to be on the 21st of December 2012 in, in one of those, those groups? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, it's possible. I, mean, I, w I went to uh, Tikal in Guatemala for the winter solstice mm -hmm. and um, connected with a woman who is... Uh, bringing together Mayan elders from around Guatemala there uh, and wants to make it larger next year and maybe the year after. So that's that's a possibility. I think it would be interesting to be at one of the sites like yeah. Tikal or Palenque mm -hmm. for the event. Although, you know, I don't necessarily, you know, expect the transformation to happen on that date, you know. Instantly, but, overnight. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but the, the, <clears throat> it might be more of a, of a process that, 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 that takes off from Yeah, that. I mean... Um, uh, you know, it, 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 yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, what do you what do you think? Do you, do you feel that there is some kind of evolution of consciousness happening? Um, I have mixed I have mixed feelings about yeah. it. Um, in the privileged circles that I'm lucky enough to move in, people who are comfortable, people who have all their needs met, uh, people who have had all the benefits of of, of education and Western middle class uh, prosperity. Um, and particularly amongst young people in that sort of socioeconomic uh, set, I, I do see yes, I do see hu huge changes taking place and and uh, an embracing of of new ideas. But when I look more broadly around the world, I see I, pe I see people mired in desperate poverty, which which uh, nothing at all has been done to address by the global community. Just just um, band aid solutions. Things that make politicians look good, but don't really don't really fix the, 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 the problems. I see, I see, tremendous hatred and misunderstanding between different ethnic groups, between different religious groups, um, and 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 I see still the the, <coughs> the dominance of the materialist idea uh, that we are that the, and reductionist materialism that we can be that the, 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 this this notion that's been spread by by scientists like uh, like Richard Dawkins, that we are no more than than our material selves, that there's nothing more to us. This seems to have been taken in al almost, you know, with their with, with their mother's milk by many people ar ar around the world who, who who never even ask themselves if there's more if there's more to life than that. So so while I do see islands of hope, and I do, uh, but 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 in, I have to say, unfortunately, in a way, largely amongst the privileged. Um, I also see a, a, a desperate situation in the world that is stopping people uh, realizing their potential. And right now, it seems um, I, I, I could not be sure that that a great change in consciousness will sweep the planet. Um, it seems to me that there are huge inimical forces operating operating against that and forcing people down and keeping them in their places and keeping them locked uh, in in a mindset. And that's going to be hard to break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess, um, yeah, there's a lot of different messages going on. Um, <clears throat> we were talking before about um, more kind of extravagant uh, possibilities mm -hmm. that uh, the, the mainstream culture doesn't really deal with. We talked about the idea that maybe it was a, a, a lost civilization, um, uh, and that maybe the Ark of the Covenant was some kind of energy device. Um, what are your thoughts about um, um, research that's been done on, on the moon? Well, um, an old friend of mine, uh, Chris Knight, who is a Freemason and who was the co-author of, uh, of an excellent book on, on Freemasonry called uh, Hiram Key, um, has, uh, has been doing a lot of work in recent years um, on the moon and, uh, and on the notion that the moon, if not an artificial satellite, um, it's, in Chris's view, it's, it's, it's clear that the, that, that, that the bedrock of the moon came from the earth. 
um, he, he, he's quite confident of that, but it seems, in his view, to have been shaped or engineered uh, or, 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 or designed, and he points to, 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 to many, many factors, much too detailed to go into here, but I would, I'd recommend uh, anybody listening to this to, to, to have, have a look for the book, Who Built the Moon? Uh, by, by Chris it's a suggestive Knight, title. Author. It's a very suggestive <laughs> title. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a book that has not received enough, uh, enough attention because it does, I mean, really, even at a very simplistic level, there are some things about the moon that are, that are absolutely uh, odd. And, you know, we were talking off camera about how uh, this this extraordinary fact that the moon perfectly eclipses the sun that the, that the ratio between the moon and the sun and the and, and the place the moon is between the earth and the sun is is so is so fine tuned that you can have the phenomenon of of an eclipse if the moon were a hundred thousand miles nearer or a hundred thousand miles further away it would be quite a different uh, quite a different picture um, secondly uh, that that it would have been impossible for for life. Uh, to evolve on this planet, certainly uh, in intelligent, sentient life, uh, if we did not have the moon, uh, that it plays a that it plays a vital role uh, in the evolution of the planet itself. And and for me, um, the most extraordinary thing of all um, is a number, and and that is that the diameter of the moon is two thousand one hundred and sixty British miles, and we don't know where the mile came from. As a measure, its origins are lost in antiquity. Um, and that number is not a random number. 2,160 is a number that is found in ancient mythology all around the world. In many different contexts, it comes up again and again and again and again. And it's uh, definitely connected to uh, Giorgio de Santillana and Hertha von Deschend in their book Hamlet's Mill, a great work of scholarship, uh, showed uh, an ancient knowledge of an astronomical phenomenon called precession of the equinoxes. Um, which unfolds at the rate of one degree every 72 years, and 72 times 30 equals 2,160. And all these numbers and, and uh, ratios related to the number 72 are just found universally distributed in myth. So I feel it's, it's at the very least, uh, an eerie uh, coincidence, and I'm convinced it's much more than a coincidence, that we find that the diameter of the moon is precisely 2,160 Earth miles. I just don't feel that can be an accident. Um, and uh, yeah, I think a lot more work needs to be needs to be done on this phenomenon because it uh, it could change everything we think about uh, what we're doing here on this planet. Did you hear about the uh, the Vatican uh, chief astronomer making this announcement about um, how if you're Catholic, uh, it's now uh, okay to believe in the existence of extraterrestrial life? Mm, I missed that. No, he did this. It was quite, a couple of years ago, and he's not only said that he said then went on to say that. Um, and if uh, extraterrestrials do exist, they wouldn't have to be converted to Catholicism because they would never have committed uh, original sin. <laughs> <laughs> very, very Catholic, very Catholic thing to say. It's rather interesting, of course, because it was the Catholic Church who burnt at the stake in uh, February 1601, uh, Giordano Bruno, and uh, whose, whose statue now stands in the, in the Plaza del Fiore in Rome. And uh, Giordano Bruno was... Um, extraordinary mystic and a visionary of his time. Uh, he, he started out as a, a Dominican monk and uh, left the monastery and, and uh, began to embrace almost an Egyptian kind of religion. He was very drawn to Hermes Trismegistus and to the, and to the Hermetic texts. But the actual reason they burnt Giordano Bruno at the stake, and they did so in a horrible way, was because he proposed the existence of life on other planets. He said, look at all those lights up in the sky. Those are other suns. And around all of those suns revolve planets like the Earth. This was, of course, in itself heresy in his period when they were still fighting the Copernican Revolution and still trying to insist mm -hmm. that the Earth was the center of the, of the system. Um, and uh, he, he said, and furthermore, I, I believe that those planets are inhabited by intelligent beings. And this drove the church into frenzy because the earth was supposed to be the center of, of, of everything and he would not recant it and he couldn't even understand it. He said, he said look, what am I doing wrong? He said, if, if, if the whole universe is filled with life and there's intelligent life on, on, all these, on all these other planets, surely that just magnifies the glory of God rather than reducing it. But the Catholic Church in that time, 1601, wouldn't buy it and they uh, inflicted upon him a most ghastly and horrific death which he endured with incredible bravery. So it's intriguing now <laughs> to hear them embracing the very thing that they burnt him for. 
we were mentioning a little bit uh, Richard Hoagland, who mm -hmm. seems an intriguing uh, yeah. kind of uh, edge edge world character. Absolutely. Um, Hoagland has proposed that the Vatican um, may possess a lot of uh, esoteric uh, knowledge that apparently they control of the astronomic uh, observatories. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that at all? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that also, you know, they may have all these troves of manuscripts, yeah. you know. I'm certain they do. Yeah. I'm, I mean, it just makes sense if you look at the way that that institution has, uh, has behaved down the ages. It's been largely about monopolizing knowledge. It's been, uh, and, and, and defining what we the masses may and may not, may and may not know. And, and when you seek to monopolize knowledge, that also involves taking knowledge out of circulation, knowledge that you don't want mm -hmm. to be in the public domain. Um, so uh, I would be very surprised if they don't have vast troves of hidden documentation, which may um, and artifacts, which 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 were they uh, available to the public, might might totally revolutionise the way we think about just e e everything. everything. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, it makes sense to me. I mm -hmm. can't prove it. Mm -hmm. I can't say, yeah, I've got this piece of evidence which mm -hmm. proves that mm -hmm. that this is happening. But uh, looking at the nature of the beast over the last uh, thousand years or so. That would be entirely consistent. What do you think of these, um, you know, kind of um, discussions that go on around um, there being elements of a secret government that have somehow contacted extraterrestrials or have maybe engineered, reverse engineered <laughs> alien technology they yeah. found and all this stuff? I have to say, I, I'm not attracted by, by those uh, arguments. Um, and... Uh, if I were to, to summarize in a very, very short way why I'm not attracted by it, um, it's this. If these hypothetical aliens or extraterrestrials, which I take it are being conceived of as physical beings rather like you and me, who just happen to have a higher technology mm -hmm. and to have come here from across the other side of the galaxy they've conquered interstellar space travel, if they want to deal with our governments, then they must be complete assholes. Um, I, I mean, really, they, they have the choice not to. Mm -hmm. And if, they, if these, if these <laughs> aliens are getting into secret agreements with the kind of people who are running our countries today, <laughs> then I don't want to know these aliens. <laughs> they're just really unattractive. Um, if, if, they're, if they're any use at all, if they have any, any, anything about them that's good, surely they would be seeking to undermine those governments and to, and to bring out human consciousness and human potential. So, so that's what bothers me about that. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the second thing that bothers me about it is, although I am sure the universe is full of life, I think that's what it's for, I think it's a home for life, um, uh, is, is that uh, it, seemed, it seems to me uh, a, much too, a much too narrow and, and very materialistic interpretation of the phenomenon and of the experiences, just to say, okay, this is guys in spaceships who are just a bit better at doing spaceships than mm -hmm. we are. Uh, I think that we are visited. I think there are encounters with entities. Um, I know there are, because I've encountered them myself in my own visionary uh, experiences at the level of consciousness. Um, but I think it's a much deeper and more complicated and mysterious problem. And if I were to put money on it, I'd put it on being an interdimensional problem rather than, than simply a distant space problem. I think it's much more complicated than just nuts and bolts, physical aliens coming here and flying saucers. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, well, I think it might be, um, you know, both and, actually. Mm -hmm. Like, um, um, yeah, I mean, I think it could be interdimensional, but then also, you know, they might have a reference point in some other mm -hmm. galaxy where they went through some evolutionary process, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we may be, you know extrapolations from those civilizations thrown here to kind of go through the whole process again. I think, you know, I was mentioning Mark's idea that <clears throat> we might be moving from this heliocentric to more like galactocentric yeah. frame of reference. <clears throat> what if that um, brings with it, you know, a um, paradigm where we begin to understand that, um, you know, we, we shift from this kind of historical or earth-centered narrative mm -hmm. to recognizing that there's a much larger context of a, of a galactic mm -hmm. uh, continuum or galactic history mm -hmm. in which, uh, you know, we're, we're embedded, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, we might find that something like Terence McKenna's idea that psilocybin is one, you know, form of agency that, that, that's um, actually, you know, at a higher state of development than we are or yeah. something. 
Uh, there, there might be a whole lot of things uh, yeah. like that going on. That makes perfect, perfect sense to me. I think the thing that, that pulls me up short, and I, and I hear it again and again from, from people everywhere, is this, this very notion that you raised at the beginning of, of these aliens being in league with our, with our governments. And I, I just can't get away from the, the, perhaps it's a prejudice mm -hmm. on my part, but I just can't get away from the feeling that, that aliens who were, who were prepared to make that deal and work with the kind of low-life liars and thieves <laughs> that we have running our countries today um, would be deeply unattractive uh, characters. Well, but aren't those liars and thieves on some level a reflection of the general state of consciousness and, and, and sort of development we, on the we planet? We get the leaders we deserve. And, we yeah. get maybe, and maybe we get the aliens we deserve as well. <laughs> maybe we do. Maybe we do. Interesting thought. Uh, I mean, also maybe... Um, yeah, I mean, we learn, you know, through biology, like this incredible complexity of, of, you know, biological life on the planet that includes, you know, symbiotic life forms, herbivores, predators, parasites, you know, may, maybe that extends, you know, even to uh, types of species that have developed technologies, you know, or, or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 true, and 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 uh, you know perhaps there are some really mean, narrow-minded, nasty aliens out there. And, right, or uh, from or from their perspective, or maybe they're kind of um, like parasites who feed off of our energy bodies, yeah. or, or or make use of our subtle energies in ways that we don't quite uh, yeah. you know have have the container conceptual containers to understand yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah. You know? that could be that could be so, and um, and certainly those who those who govern us are. Um, are low enough to do such deals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hand us over as sort of sacrificial victims in one way or another. And what, what do you make of the uh, crop circle phenomenon? Yeah, I was, uh, the, 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 there's, a, there's a bit of telepathy going on. I'm going to bring up the same thing. Because that's if, if there is, um, is, is an, uh, uh, let us not say alien, but if the other, whoever the other is, is in some way uh, involved in that. Maybe that is a democratization. Maybe that is speaking directly to the people. Maybe that is putting down messages which which everybody can see and allowing us the choice to to make what we want of it. We can either dismiss it as our media persuade us to do with all this Doug and Dave bullshit, um, uh, or we can embrace it mm -hmm. and, uh, and 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 look more 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 closely into it. And I, I certainly see you know interest in this phenomenon growing. I mean, I live in Crop Circle Central mm -hmm. in, in England, right in the, in the middle. You know, I live in Bath, very close to the, all of the, 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 the main Crop Circle areas. And, and, and you can see it's like a magnet. I mean, it's drawing people from all over the world. You've gone into a few of them? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, but I have to confess that uh, this is the 2009 was the first year that I seriously looked at uh, Crop Circles. And the reason that I looked at them was, uh, was my son Luke, who, who'd been to see some and, and uh, you know, suggested to me strongly I was missing out on something really important. And yeah, yeah, I think they're, uh, they're an extraordinary, extraordinary phenomenon. I don't doubt that some of them are made by um, hoaxers, if you want to call it that, uh, but some of them are definitely not. Uh, and I'd felt this even before I, before I visited crop circles. I mean, it's inconceivable. It's funny know. how with a lot of this phenomena, it's like you may know, you may feel that something's interesting, but you know also it kind of like... It takes a lot to go into it, so you kind of like put it off. Yeah, that's know? that's right. You know, that's it's because right. like, you know you're gonna. It's like, ah, oh, it's another thing. I'm gonna have to like confess to an interest in and yeah. talk about. You know, that's 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 true. <laughs> and I and I kind of felt that I kind of felt this this wasn't this wasn't what 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 I did. It wasn't and your stick. There were others who were doing it, but I'm beginning to re to realize that that was that was um, that was narrow minded of uh, of me. Um, it's curious, also. Uh, rather like the Nazca lines, I mean, the, these the, the, these uh, for, formations um, visually are are absolutely best seen from the from from the air. Immersed in them, you don't get that that full sense of of of, of, of what is of what is happening there. So um, yeah, I intend to spend more time in and around and hopefully above crop circles uh, in the in the coming in the coming years. Uh, it would it's the hoaxer thing. Uh, I, 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 and I felt this before I, I ever visited a crop circle. It makes no sense that a group of the most talented artists in the world, landscape artists working on a gigantic right. scale, uh, without ever making a mistake and never being seen and never having the ego ever to declare right. themselves and put them. It just makes no sense. Right. It, it's a crazy idea. It has to be, there's a deep mystery at the bottom of this. But what exactly that mystery is, I'm not sure. 
So, I mean, um, I guess one thing that I, I keep thinking about is, um, um, you know, did the, the kind of um, elite of cultures like the Maya and the Egyptians actually have access to um, psychic technologies that uh, we don't really yet understand? And if they did, can we like begin to reaccess? Should we? Do we want to begin to reaccess some of those um, skills and capacities? Or is that something that that? I think that... the answer to both questions, as far as I'm concerned, is yes. Yes, the, <laughs> yes, the ancients mm -hmm. used spiritual technologies, psychic technologies, and uh, yes, uh, we should attempt to regain access to them. Not because. Um, it will uh, make us able to do even better what we do already. But because, by, by definition, um, going through the, the consciousness change that would be required in order to, to become effective um, at the psychic level uh, would, I believe, change us uh, for the better. And, and maybe the, the global crisis that we're in is, is in a way, um, pushing us to, 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 to make that kind of leap. I think it is because I think we've reached the limits actually of what uh, of what technology uh, can do. Certainly, our our, our technology um, and and um, our our whole our whole economic model is so is so cannibalistic and so and and, and so destructive that, that sooner or later it is inevitably mm -hmm. going to consume itself. Mm -hmm. um, so so you know we need to. We need to find another way to do things, and the evidence is abundant that that there were ancient cultures uh, who had tapped into that, and the evidence is abundant, uh, although they do not use it for for um, world domination. Mm -hmm. Is that shamanistic hunter gatherer uh, societies are able to tap into that mystery uh, as well, and largely for nourishing mm -hmm. and positive reasons, whether it be healing, whether it be bringing rain whether it be finding the right place to, to hunt the mm -hmm. animal that you need to that you need to eat. Do you think that something like the Great Pyramid was kind of like a, a multi-purpose device? I mean, do you think it had a number of functions? I think it had a number of functions, very, very, very definitely. Um, there's no doubt that it has um, a, a spiritual function to, to, connected to the evolution of the soul, certainly as the ancient Egyptians saw it. It seems to be a model, almost a three-dimensional model, uh, both the Great Pyramid and, and uh, the network of tunnels and, and, and corridors, some of which have been discovered, some of which have not yet been discovered, which lie, lie beneath it, see, it seemed to me to have been a model of, of, of the afterlife realm, as the ancient Egyptians conceived it, and they felt it was very important uh, to prepare for the journey that we make after death. And, and I'm, I'm certain that the Great Pyramid was involved in a process of initiation and um, preparation uh, for, for the afterlife journey. But there's much more to it than that. The Great Pyramid sits on latitude 30, you know, um, uh, I I exactly one third of the way between the North Pole, between the equator and the, and, and, and the North Pole. It's perfectly, almost perfectly, within a tiny fraction of a single degree, uh, oriented to true north, south, uh, east, and west. Um, it has huge geodetic uh, functions. Um, it is, um, it is a, a scale model. Uh, of the northern hemisphere of the of the Earth, um, if you take the perimeter of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by forty three thousand two hundred, which is another <laughs> another one of those numbers that we <laughs> mentioned with the moon, it's a multiple of two thousand one hundred sixty. Uh, you get the equatorial circumference of the Earth, and if you take the height yeah. of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by the same number, you get the polar radius of the Earth. So somebody, whoever made that pyramid, and we don't know for sure. Uh, they built into it the dimensions of our planet. So it seems to me that there's a second a geodetic and earth measuring mm -hmm. uh, a geographical function connected to the Great Pyramid. And I wouldn't be surprised if it turns out to be linked to other ancient sites all around the world, perhaps in a, in a longitude grid mm -hmm. uh, around the planet. So those would be... You know, those What's, be, isn't it linked to a Stonehenge um, um, longitudinally? I'm not sure about Stonehenge. The one I've thoroughly researched is Angkor Wat in mm -hmm. Cambodia, mm -hmm. and there is a precisely 72 two mm -hmm. degrees of longitude between the Great Pyramid and Angkor Wat, and an incredible similarity of spiritual ideology in both uh, in both places. Um, the connection to Stonehenge, I'm not so sure, and I can't can't speak mm -hmm. authoritatively on that. But I have. I have um, um, there was this uh, guy Hank Wesselman. Yes. Did you read his account of, uh, he did this shamanic um, ceremony in the Great Pyramid and claimed to have an like, out-of-body experience. I've he heard that, yeah. He found yeah. himself in the body 
Actually, it sounds a little Avatar-like. Yeah. He found himself in, in the body of a tall alien being mm. on another planet who mm. was living in this cave complex, mm. but had this huge thing, kind of like one of the Egyptian gods, mm. wearing an outfit, kind of like one of the Egyptian gods, mm. who apparently was expecting mm. his arrival and was communicating telepathically to wow. its whole kind of clan. Mm. He describes it pretty... Um, uh, mm. like so a, it would become almost a, <clears throat> like a communication device. Yes, what he, what he was basically thinking was that, and I don't know, I mean, I associated Siri, the star system Sirius with mm-hmm. it, that um, it was a portal that there was like an a, um, elder humanoid species mm-hmm. that was more evolved than us, that had actually not gone the technological path, mm-hmm. that was maybe meant to be our um, guides mm-hmm. that we'd had this, this connection with, yeah. and that the connection had gotten uh, severed. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I regard that as, um, as a reasonable... Uh, a reasonable conclusion to come to, particularly in the light of the experience that he had that you just that you just described. But you know, the Great Pyramid is just um, is just so steeped in, in in mystery, and and it has a power and it has an energy which is which is palpable. Um, even though now today it is um, it is divorced from the religious system to which it was connected in in ancient Egyptian, Egyptian times. It still, and I've observed this over more than 20 years, it still has a transformative effect on people who are drawn to it. And, and, and in my experiences, there, there, are, there are two kinds of people uh, who are confronted by the Great Pyramid. And one kind will see it just as a heap of stones. Uh, and others, far the majority, uh, feel that they're touching the heart of a mystery. And, and they, they feel humbled and and overawed by it, but also inspired and transformed by it. And they go away. It's as though it's working. It's still working, even though uh, the system that was attached to it is no longer part of our lives. Somehow it, 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 it can do it on its own. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, for me, uh, it forced me into a process of inquiry. When I first encountered the Great Pyramid in 1989, yeah, I was, I was immediately just, it was like an electric shock. I mean, I was just, wow. What is this thing? And then, and then, because my curiosity was aroused, and I think it was designed to do this, it made me start doing research. I hadn't done any astronomy before. I was absolutely awfully bad at mathematics. They were all things. It's the same were, kind of effect that the crop circles has on all these yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It had that effect on me, and it made me dig, and it made me inquire, and it made me equip myself with information that I would not otherwise have equipped myself with. And in the process of equipping me with that information, it changed me. Mm-hmm. Have you managed to go into the uh, Palenque uh, tomb of the inscriptions? Yes, yes. Did you have any of the same type of resonance with that? With that? Moment? Yes, a little bit. A little and bit. there is, and there is, um, <clears throat> you know, it is, it is a rather, it is a rather curious thing because there are those ducts that come up from the sarcophagus chamber in the in the Palenque uh, pyramid, um, and the similar idea in both of the two main chambers in the Great Pyramid. You have these. Um, uh, you have these shafts that, that cut up through the body of the pyramid. Exactly the same thing is found at, mm-hmm. at, at Palenque. And what exactly these are for is not clear. There's been a lot of speculation that it's some, kind of, some sort of duct to guide the soul of the pharaoh to the stars, or, of, or in this case, of the lion king. Cool. Well, I'm getting exhausted. Me too. But um, I'm super excited and I'm happy to, that we've gotten a little deeper. I could go another deep in, but um, we will stop there for now. Another time. Yeah. It's been cool. <laughs> nice to talk to you, Dan.